The Koi Gig Pod and OTB Sports in association with Cadbury. A player and a half deserves a glass and a half of support. Everyone ran their socks off tonight and they left everything out there. They're very proud of the, the team's performance. Set the shackles off Katie a bit so that she can go and play her game. We're going to go out there to beat them. We're going to try and beat them. Hello there and welcome to the Koi Gig Pod, your go-to podcast for all the latest happenings in the Women's Super League, Irish football and everything in between. I'm Kathleen McNamee and I'm joined by Karen Duggan. Karen, how are you? Good, very well. Um, very cold and dreary out, but we at least we weren't playing football in it like some of our WSL games had to put up with. I think Villa West Ham looks like. I was just very glad I was watching on my couch, put it that way. Yeah, definitely. I even saw some of the games over, I think it was Ajax PSV was called off because the pitch was literally unplayable because of the rain. So thankfully we didn't have any of that because we've had enough cancellations of the games that we're supposed to be talking about (laughs) to last us a lifetime. We have a full slate this week, which is good. Um, The Koi Gig Pod on OTB Sports in association with Cabri FC, official snack partner to the Republic of Ireland women's national team. Joining us a little later will be Birmingham and Ireland's Harriet Scott. And as I said, we have a full weekend of fixtures so we will be getting properly dug into those and we will also have our Koi Gig Team of the Week with Emma Carroll a bit later on. Speaking of the said fixtures, Karen, is there anywhere in particular that you would like to start? Normally I choose, but I was like, we'll do something a little different this week and you can choose where we start. Yeah, we'll start off maybe on a bit of a negative note for some of our Irish girls. There's a huge um, bottom of the clash table between Leicester and Birmingham and Birmingham for the second time against their main rivals. Uh, coming up short um, and you'd have to say on the balance things that Leicester did deserve it and I know that Birmingham got a consolation goal to our own Louise Quinn at the end but that really did feel like what it was I thought that Sigsworth was really really lively Um, obviously won a penalty uh, converted the penalty and I thought Leicester just in general outplayed Birmingham Yeah I would definitely agree I mean it's been It's been a tough season watching both of them at various points, Mm -hmm. but you just feel like Leicester have been able to pull it out of the bag the few times that they've needed to. And with Birmingham, they just haven't been able to do that. I mean, they've had like that one big win, but apart from that, there hasn't been anything. And I think on the balance of things, out of the two teams, they probably do deserve to go down. It's funny, you look at it at any other season and a team like Everson probably would be kind of worried as well. But because of how poorly Birmingham have performed this season, it doesn't actually matter as much for them, which I'd say they're thanking their lucky stars for considering yeah. how up and down topsy-turvy their season has. But yeah, it's That's very it. we, Yeah, We just haven't been talking about anyone else in the relegation battle. You thought maybe Villa or Everton, obviously, um, really poor run of form, uh, particularly at the start of the season. But no, it's just been a, a, a straight shooter between these two and Leicester are coming out on top at the moment. Hopefully, there'll be more twists and turns to it. Um, I think that there's still definitely going to be some more twists and turns at the top of the league. Um, again, judging by this weekend's scores, um, we saw Arsenal drawing with Man United. Um, very exciting game. There was a lot to talk about in that one. Yeah, this game was very interesting. I really enjoyed it. Like, there are so many point, like good talking points for both sides. I think it just shows Manchester United how much, you know, at the start of the season, we were talking a little bit about how maybe they didn't have an identity under Skinner. We weren't really sure what he was trying to do. But I think that match in the last couple of definitely answered a lot of those questions. Do they still need to reinforce a bit more probably in the summer? But I think definitely anyone, and I and count myself in this <laughs> category, anyone who was criticising them before Christmas or a little bit earlier in the season, it's kind of eaten their words a bit now. Yeah, no, they're, they're very good to watch. They're very high energy. It was, it was a real battle between the two teams. And yeah, they, they got stuck into Arsenal and then Arsenal obviously sometimes they don't like that and we saw obviously Katie getting herself red carded two rash challenges I don't think she can have too many complaints about them she could say maybe the second one she stood up or her studs went through um so yeah it was unfortunate for them they did bounce back they showed a lot of character and I think I think everyone if they haven't seen the Vivian Miedema pass for Black Stenny's first goal for Arsenal they should go and look at it now because she didn't even have to break stride it was absolutely sublime um that was I enjoyed just watching it on repeat yeah. like just yeah. over and over again <laughs> yeah and it's rightfully getting the attention it deserves um if most people yeah. usually given out about me about being in such a deep position you wander higher up the pitch but if she's going to be producing assists like that I'm sure Black Stenius will be very happy and people who 
very Arsenal fans would be very happy to see the two of those link up because there was a question would it be one or the other but um, two world class players combining there to to drag Arsenal to keep that point and obviously with Chelsea winning it was important that they got something on the board Definitely I was going to ask you a bit about that Black Sonia's medium kind of matchup because Miriam, I was talking after the match and she was kind of asked, you know, did she think her performance on the day would silence anyone who've maybe critiqued her a little bit this season about not being in her best form? I mean, Miriam's not best form was still pretty good compared to everyone else, but she said, I don't really care about what other people think. And then she was talking about linking it with Blackstonius and she said that I hope I'm going to spend a lot more time on the pitch with her together. I'm pretty flexible. I think someone like Stina can give us an extra dimension. And I think sometimes where Miriam's maybe got a little bit lost in the Ars- I say lost in the Arsenal team but like she hasn't had that strike partner she hasn't had that person that she can play deep and put those balls to so do you think that maybe this is something that Adavel was thinking about when he brought Black Stinius in in terms of keeping Miedema in the team and giving her maybe this is something that she asked for someone that she can play those sort of balls to and play in a role that she prefers yeah, possibly. It's hard to know or it's hard to say if she's just been given this role and obviously she's so world class that she can adapt to that deeper lion role. Um, Arsenal obviously felt like they needed more firepower there. A lot of the responsibility was falling on Vivian Mead. Now, obviously, Bet Mead was really chipping in there at the start of the season as well. Um, but like, you're never going to complain about having a world class player to play with. And it maybe gives them um, a second focal point in attack and maybe a bit more diversity in how they play because just looking at the way Chelsea move up front obviously we talk about their top four a lot but the harder cutter like that the whole dynamic that they have going on up front is so relentless um and when they click they really really do click so maybe Arsenal are thinking along those lines that they just need to have a bit more flexibility in those top positions yeah, I think after that game against United Arsenal, we'll be looking at the matchup against Chelsea on Friday and wondering what they can do for their defence to make sure that they do keep that Chelsea forward line in check. Because judging by what you saw on at the weekend, it's not looking good for them when they come up against a team like Chelsea. I know, I mean, Williamson and Wilbur Moy weren't there, so it was Bietti and Catley in. And I just... I mean, having seen players like Jen Beattie at the FA Cup final, I just don't think she has the the quality maybe necessary to operate in that back line and also provide the sort of defensive cover that a team like Arsenal need, especially coming up against Chelsea, who got a very important win against Man City and now go to Arsenal with a game in hand and two points behind them on the table. So everything seems to be kind of on the line this week. And I feel this has consistently happened for Chelsea and Arsenal, whether it's Champions League or the actual league. There have been just massive weeks for the two. Yeah, and the wind is really in Chelsea's sails now because you look at it and say, oh, it's a 1-0 win, but City were on a great run of form and City kind of seemed like they were back to themselves. And they did cause Chelsea some difficulties, mostly from set pieces, though. Chelsea probably should have converted more of their chances. They did create an awful lot. Um, Guru right and popping up with the goal, a great glance and header. If she'd gone for the near post, I think it would have been saved, but she directed it brilliantly into the far side um, of the net. And yeah, they just, they looked like they were really, really up for it. Um, none of, no questions over fatigue or injuries or anything like that, that maybe were happening for some of their um, closer performances or their well, say poorer performances at the start. Of the year. They haven't had too many, but um, but yeah, I was just really, really impressed with the particularly the attack and talent. They just seemed quite relentless. Um, and against a city team who who did well, and they sat back a little bit deeper. And I think Arsenal might have to do that. So it might be a game where the attackers are a little bit frustrated because I think on the balance of things, Chelsea are looking just that little bit more dangerous at the moment. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see how Adebel does set up because he does, he's not the sort of manager that likes to let his team no, sit back. we saw that in the Champions League against Barcelona and, and look what happened there. So maybe yeah. it's a lesson learned or maybe he just completely backs the shape and formation he's he's used to going with. Um, but it'll be interesting to see, I think, that a point, obviously, it doesn't really suit either of them. So it's kind of exciting to, to see them both go for it. Um, so whether they go for it on the counter-attack or whether they just trust their normal way of playing that they can dominate the game, it'll be really interesting to see what Adebel does. 
Yeah, I did think to Emma Hayes's credit that the way she set the team up against Chelsea was a bit one of her more tactical masterclasses that we have seen this season, especially the way that she kept players like Lauren Hemp, who we talk about all the time. Mm-hmm. She was kept very quiet. City have got like a lot of success out of getting the ball down the wings and then getting that final pass on to Kadisha Shaw. There was none of that happening. And they also looked happy to let City have the ball and play around. There wasn't any sort of fear on their side they knew exactly what they wanted to do and they were set up to do it which maybe we haven't seen that sort of level of control from Chelsea in recent times with some of the matches that they have had so it's interesting to see that it's still there and I'd say Arsenal are wishing that it wasn't coming this week that they were discovering that Uh, another big win for Tottenham after kind of a difficult start their first win of 2022 which we necessarily wouldn't have said would be the case considering how the first half of their season went and Another bit of a disastrous loss for Brighton. I mean, it's been it's been a tough run for Hope Powell, and especially I think for everyone who looked at her, the way she has set that team up and was expecting big things from Brighton. I think people will be wondering where did it all go wrong. Yeah, Spurs really needed that win, obviously, because they had set themselves such high expectations at the start of the season, and they really controlled the game. I mean, it could have been before they even got their second goal; they could have been three up. Brighton just looked at sixes and sevens. They didn't really know how to deal with anything defensively. And um, yeah, they were just kind of torn apart. Even I think the first one was just a long ball and Brighton just seemed a little bit static just on their heels. And that I don't know if that's just a confidence thing every week. You've built up a run of form and training seems harder and everything seems, the legs seem heavier. But yeah, they just, again, were a bit of a no-show. Obviously credit to Spurs, they came out and they attacked and they did well. Um, but Brighton, yeah, they're worrying signs for them. Definitely. Well, I think it's a seven match winless run for them and they've never done that in the WSL before. So you'll be kind of looking at it and going where where are the, the wins going to come from and what has to change. We touched on it slightly, but Everton, another loss for them and another good win for Reading. Obviously, they fired John luke Fester in the middle of the week. One of those suspicious ones where the press release came through, I think it was like 11 or midnight and you're like, okay, that doesn't really, that seems like something you're trying to get under the carpet rather than a big announcement but second firing for them you just wonder what is going on it really feels like a club that's in disarray after bringing in nine players in the summer firing Willie Kirk now firing John Lundvester as we said they would be doing a relegation battle if it wasn't for the fact that Birmingham have just been so so poor this season and disappointing yeah they just need some sort of stability and this obviously isn't going to help whether it's working out with Fesser or not just more media attention on them and a, a game where they started kind of brightly they were confident but then once the goal went in Reading kind of picked up and again they credit to them they're becoming kind of the bounce back team they, they are conceding but they're coming back and they're getting their goals back which they weren't at the start of the season so it was a good win for Reading but it'll be interesting to see if someone comes out and lets us know what's going on behind the scenes because on the balance of things with the players they signed they should be doing better but two managerial exits yeah, it's just not good signs for them, is it? No, especially for a team that do have such a history and a legacy in the WSL, you would like to see things going a bit better for them. And then finally, we had West Ham beating Aston Villa 2-1. Nothing majorly came out of that match. I don't think you really saw all that much that told you about either team. I don't know if you feel differently, Karen. No, I don't think so. I think they were even enough, but I think um, Villa will certainly be looking at their conversion rate. I think that they... They made a few chances, but they they just weren't clinical enough at all. And and West Ham were the opposite. Then they got a couple of chances and they stuck them away. Obviously, one was maybe a penalty. But um, yeah, it was, it was kind of an expected result, but also something that Phil will be looking at and thinking we need to, these are the kind of games we need to be at least getting a point from. Because again, another team that probably would be dragged into that battle had the other two not had such disastrous starts to the season. Definitely. Well, if you have any opinions, suggestions or thoughts on the season and how it's going and please let us know how do you think the Arsenal-Chelsea battle on Friday is going to go. We will definitely name and shame you if you get it entirely wrong next week when we record the podcast. Get them into us on Twitter at Off the Ball using the hashtag OTB Koi Gig. So after our very first, very successful edition of the Koi Gig Transfer Awards, I'm already looking forward to our summer version. We've gone back to our team of the week. Emma, how are you? Good. We had a full weekend of fixtures, which is nice. 
Yes, I know we've debated this back and forth so much about which we actually prefer, but I do quite like it when there's the full selection of players who have made it onto your team of the week for. So goalkeeper, we have Grace Maloney, um, Jess Carter, uh, Ruby Mace, and Ona Batier. I'm going to say, Gurhu uh, Wright and Katie Zellum, Savitikva, Aaron Cuthbert, Her- Harder, Midema, and Russo up front. Did you take our United criticism on board? From- <laughs> <laughs> it definitely <laughs> seems that way, doesn't it? And okay. you know, Mary Earps was nearly in goal as well. Only that Maloney saved the penalty, so she, she yeah, picked, she was the first one. I was going to say, uh, she had a couple of phenomenal saves yeah. in that game. I think the one from Medema, like that, was coming at her from eight yards out, um, and to get such a strong touch. That was an unbelievable save, but obviously Grace played a huge part of that comeback. Um, so and to save her second, I'd say Izzy Christensen is cursing her her second penalty <laughs> save from her this season. But yeah, it was great to see, and obviously great from us from an Irish point of view to see her in such good form. Yeah, and we always have to have some kind of Irish representation in the eleven. So I don't think Kate is not doing us any favors. No. <laughs> No, between suspensions and sending off, and she's really taken it to heart of not wanting to be in our team of the week. Um, no, I definitely I agreed with Grace Maloney as well. I thought she was great. Mary Earps definitely deserved a, a special mention, but I think as well, especially with everything Maloney's gone through in the last couple of weeks in terms of injuries and the like, it is great to see her performing. It was actually normally when you send through these team of the weeks, like a couple of hours before we record, I normally like do a list of what I agree and disagree with. And this is one of the few weeks where there was actually quite a bit more agreeing than there was disagreeing. And I think it just shows the standard that there was. Um, I thought like players like Spitkova, who we haven't had on a team of the week before, was really, really good. Obviously scored as well, but like just in terms of where she was on the pitch, there was no point where she was just standing still. She was up and she was down. One of those players that you watch and you're like, I would have liked to have seen a heat map of where you actually were on the pitch for the whole thing. Yeah, I felt like a lot of West Ham's play went through her. Um, yeah, I think she definitely deserved a nod. And as you said, we haven't had her in the team of the week, I don't think, so far this season. So definitely worth a shout because it's been a couple of games where she's really shone through. So it's worth a shout. Um, I think Ruby Mace as well and um, done really well at centre back, like so young. And some of her challenges kept Sam Kerr really quiet. And that one in the box where she just timed it perfectly because if she didn't, it was. I, I really thought it was going to be a penalty and then like she just timed it perfectly to nick the ball away um I definitely think she she was worth a show from Manchester City's point of view yeah definitely credit to her because you could see from your team that Chelsea put on a very very good performance you've got four Chelsea people in there is it? four yeah and just Sophie Ingle was close as well yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go back to my Man United bias here and say that needs to be cut out. <laughs> no, but they were all very, very good. I think Harder in particular, the last few weeks, she's just um just heard the way she links up and she's so direct and down that left hand flank, she can pop up anywhere, but she's so good down the left. It's kind of Mida Matesque or Henri the way she does that, but um she's very, very direct and I think she's enjoying herself and has quality players around her to link up with. I think we're starting to see the best of her as well. I think everything was about Kerr and Kirby last season. And I think, especially since the turn of the new year, I think Harder is just starting to come into her own and starting to show that talent that we knew she'd had. And it's just, it's really exciting to watch. Mm. I actually, of the, all the complaints that I had with the team, most of them came in the forwards. And it wasn't necessarily that I disagreed with the players you had put in there but I thought there was a few that deserved a bit of a shout out someone like Natasha Dowie who I think she's kind of flown under the radar a little bit I know we've talked about her once or twice um but mostly it seems to have been when the bigger names aren't playing but she has now scored like only Kerr and Miedema have scored more goals than her she's equal on goals with Kim Little and uh Frank Kirby and I think considering the team that she is playing in and the players she has around her compared to the other ones, it's really impressive what she has done. And also the fact that she is, she's a bit of a WSL veteran. She's been mm-hmm. around for a lot longer than some of the other players too. So to see her hitting that peak in such a latter season, it's really nice. And she hit the six at the weekend. So that kind of, for me, made her like, I think she had her shout for getting in the team. Good shout, yeah. but I think uh, Midima's pass just, you know, <laughs> made her gonna, I don't think like, I could have had a team without putting her in there um, without thinking of that pass because it was just world-class. It was just unbelievable. And I you know she said after 
after the game as well that she told Stina to just keep making those runs that she she'd get it to her. So it's just it's nice to hear that, and it's quite exciting that you know maybe we'll see more of the two of them together because it's really good. I'd love to see it happen against Chelsea on Friday because it's just, it's one thing doing it against United, but you could just imagine how mad the Arsenal fans will go if they manage to get a pass like that off against Chelsea. I don't think it will happen, but <laughs> a girl can dream. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because yeah. the Chelsea defence, they were looking mean as well. Another shout, even just for one moment in the game, I think it was Millie Bright's stop in the box with her head at the end. Um, again, it was just saved them three points. Chelsea could have won that game by more, but equally City could have nicked it and there was bodies on the line when they needed to be. It wasn't just the the strikers that were um, putting themselves about. So um, yeah, she was maybe in with a shout, but I do agree generally with most of the team here. Yeah, I would agree with Millie Bright as well. And she's a player that I sometimes criticise a little bit. Mm, maybe because I think she, she is really good and she's very defensively strong, but sometimes I feel that she does maybe the dirtier side of things for Chelsea. You know, she's the player that's in there getting the Louise Quinn-esque headers away or whatever <laughs> it is. Um, but I thought she was really, really impressive against Man City at the weekend. And normally she's not the sort of player that I would be picking out and being like, yeah, I'm going to give you some credit here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think they're, they seem to be coping a lot better um, this season without Ericsson. Last season when Ericsson was out, they you could tell that she was a massive miss, um, but they seem to be coping that a little bit better and they're a little bit more defensively solid as well at the back. So, yeah, I thought Jess Carter had a, had a really good game as well for Chelsea um, and her cross for the goal as well was, was spot on. Well, Emma, thank you again for joining us and giving us your team of the week. I mean, this is probably one of the nicer ones we've had where we've all <laughs> sat here and been very nice to each other. And said, it was yeah, a nice please. weekend of football. <laughs> Yeah, well, hopefully we'll get a bit more nice football at the weekend and we can fight over who deserves to be in the team of the week. Um, we want to hear, obviously, what you at home think about our team of the week. Did Emma nail it with her selection? Did we miss someone glaringly terrible? Do you just want to talk about that Vivian made my pass? Because I will literally talk to anyone about it. Get all your opinions into us on Twitter at Off The Ball using the hashtag OTB Koi Gig. Joining us this week is Birmingham, Ireland's Harriet Scott. Harriet, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I heard before we came on the recording that you've just come back from college. So we appreciate you fitting us into what must be an incredibly busy schedule between football and studies and everything else you seem to get up to. Yeah, well, that, you know, thanks for having me. It's uh, nice to see you both. And I haven't seen Karen for a long time, so it's nice to see Karen again. Uh, yeah, it's just been a bit of a long day, but I'm here now. So. <laughs> Well, we promise we'll be nice. We're, Karen's lovely on this podcast. She never teases anyone yeah, about it. I'm anything. not myself at all, Harriet. <laughs> no, no, okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, how have you been finding the season? Because obviously you are one of the players that very much juggles football alongside your fourth year medical student now. Is that right? Yeah. Yep, that, so yeah it's not year. even like you're juggling something kind of casual. You're <laughs> juggling something quite heavy. How have you found it so far this season? Uh, yeah, I think every year has been sort of harder than the last, I think. Um, the uh, Yeah, I always have to kind of give cl- uh, credit to like the club for Blues and the university. They are very good with allowing me to kind of pursue both things um, and supporting me in both directions. And that's always been the, the biggest thing for me. It, it has been hard this season. It's been a, a bit of a change more towards like clinical practice and spending much more time in the hospital, which is great but obviously makes it a bit more difficult because they expect you to try and be in nine to five plus the extra hours and then also study all the things that they don't teach you and that's been really hard but um I've really enjoyed it because we get a lot more patient contact and that's hopefully what I'm aiming to eventually be doing at the end so no it's been it's been good challenging but fun I've listened to a few different things you've done and you've always spoken very passionately about the idea of players having like dual careers are two different things and you've also said at the same time that for you personally it's just something that you enjoy doing you enjoy having a little bit extra along the side along with your football even when you did turn pro is that when you have those really hard days is that the thing that you keep going back to at the back of your head or is it just the passion for the subject that you're doing that carries you through yeah it's a, it's a great question I yeah I think I have always quite I've been quite outspoken in the fact that I think that people should try and do both I think in the women's game as yet it's obviously not quite like the men's in terms of uh, the 
the rewards but well the financial rewards anyway um so I do think it's really important and then like the career of football it's 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 not a long career um and you know it might be taken away from you or it might you know be something that you don't want to pursue anymore so I, I do think that it's important that people just try and do it doesn't necessarily even have to be education but something else um and even those who don't want to do education have no interest I think if you are only ever concentrating on football you'll only ever be able to do that and then you won't be able to actually take your mind away from it and I, I do think that the people that perform the best aren't always 100% doing one thing they have to have their own downtime my downtime is when football is going a certain way and I'm maybe not enjoying it all so much or it's really difficult I can kind of throw myself into my studies and I, I forget about everything else at the moment because I don't have enough time to think about much else and then vice versa when uni isn't going so well or it's a really really busy time I can actually go you know I'm going to put this to, to the side in the moment I'm actually going to go and study and yeah uh, sorry go play football and take my mind away from it so it's it's yeah for, for me it's exactly what I need I need that balance and I think that it is really important that people have it as well yeah way to make us feel that about ourselves my balance is sleeping <laughs> and Netflix so yeah that's great but it is great to hear that because you were obviously there for the last few years there's been such a push on the Irish team for everyone to go professional is definitely one of the reasons I thought, start, first started thinking about stepping away um, because I was like yourself loved the balance of both and didn't want to fully commit um, do you think that more should be done in terms of encouraging that um, side of things? I know that that's not really a manager's job, but do you think that there should be uh, an influence from within that setup, from the international setup that kind of says, OK, girls, it's not forever. Have a think, even just for your mental health, about balance. That's a really, really good question. I, I like I like I would love the idea of that, that we're fully supported in sort of every aspect of our life. But obviously, in terms of international what people want to do is as much as they want to develop people they want to try and get the best out of those people in that campaign and, and achieve as much as possible um for the longevity of those players and and that player pool it would be great to be able to say okay we fully support you in your footballing achievements but equally want you to be well balanced individuals that's something that I think I think we could do better um because there are so many talented players that like, like you're saying, can't choose or won't choose or don't want to choose um, going professional because it's it's a whole lifestyle change. And actually, if we don't choose those players and keep those players involved, then we're losing a massive pool of players that are really talented. Like yourself, Caro, I think you still could still be involved. But uh, yeah, that's just my personal Netflix opinion. Couldn't, do you not just hear my hobbies? I know Netflix and sleeping. Oh, no. I think that's, <laughs> that's keep some very a, solid hobbies. I, I actually keep like a little scorecard of all the various Irish players that come onto this podcast and tell Karen that she should come back to the setup in some regard. And I think we're basically every single week that it has been mentioned either live on recording or afterwards. So. I'll come back and talk about balance. Yeah. And how you can balance do it. With very important. Yeah. <laughs> so, Harry, I think you make some really great points there. And it's something that I think even in the men setup is being talked about more and more. I know I think it was a Pippa Grange was a psychologist who worked with the England men's team before the World Cup. And a lot of what she instituted then was using the Euros as well. And it was basically that you should have things outside of football. We've always had this idea that to be successful, you need to commit, 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 and you can't have anything else. And for some people that is how their brain works and that's perfectly fine. But for other people, just because they have something outside of it, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to underperform. They actually need that space. You see it with conversations, say, around the stuff that Marcus Rashford even does, that other people being like, oh, he's distracted from football. But the stuff that she's always said is that, well, no, he might not necessarily be. Maybe that's what he needs to keep himself, you know, sane in the middle of all the footballing. So I think it's important. And it's something that has been brought up a couple of times on the podcast. I know Amber Barrett and Tom Elms in particular talked a lot about education, even on like keeping girls in education and supporting that through the FAI. So it's always interesting to hear from players like yourself who have actually done it. You have chosen one of the more difficult paths, I would say, than most people choosing medicine. <laughs> but also before that, you did have physio and that was something that you were committed to. At what point with that journey did you decide that you wanted to go a bit further and study medicine as well as already having your background in physio? 
uh, it, it was a very windy road. Um, yeah, when I kind of first started uh, college uni, I did not think I wanted to go anywhere near medicine. It was something that like I admired that other people did, like Kira Grant, Dora Gorman at that time, they were studying and also playing at a really high level. That was something that I admired, but it just wasn't sort of, I didn't picture that. I, I remember picking physio because it sort of suited me as like, I like I enjoyed the idea of healthcare. I enjoy sports. That's sort of how that came about. And I really enjoyed that course. I had three great years at university where I fully embraced my university experience. And then after that, I worked as a physio full time for two years at the same time as playing semi-professional for Reading because they weren't yet. Uh, they were in the WSL2 at the time. And then after that, I got an opportunity when we got promoted with Reading to the WSL, I got an opportunity to go professional, which I ended up uh, taking that up, but then still working part time as a physio. So at the time, the wage that I was on was a fine, an OK wage, but I still needed to work part time. So and it worked quite well for me. I was able to still work as a physio, do work at with the NHS and then work in the evening as a physio, but then train mostly for full time. I think I missed one day a week. And then the year after that, I got an opportunity, another another contract and offer to go full time and to stop the physio, which I was like, well, if I'm ever going to do it and go you know, commit fully to this, this is the time I'm going to do it and the opportunity to do it. So I did. Um, and I did enjoy it. It was like a really nice like sidestep to what I thought my career, my life was going to be like. Really enjoyed it. You know, committed everything to it. And I, I just remember being at home and my mum has always, always always been quite like, you know, encouraging of all the things I want to do. And I remember uh, sitting there watching uh, CSI in the afternoon after my training session in the morning, because that was one of my favourite shows in daytime TV. And then as I was watching it, I remember my mum came in and she was like, you know, what are you doing? Like, is this what you're doing today? And I was like, I, I'm, I'm actively, this is my recovery. I'm, I'm doing this because this is for my football, which is my job. And I like, it was obviously that sort of my mum not understanding what I was doing and me tr trying to sort of explain it. It was a bit of a, a funny moment. And then at come towards the end of that season, I remember thinking, I don't want to just do football. Like I'm missing something. I felt like at the end of every season, obviously the season finishes. And then it's almost like everything that happened in the last year, almost, doesn't matter because it's all closed it's done that chapter's gone and I don't think there's many jobs that are quite like that when that season is done you just got to move on to the next one and nothing matters from what happened last season and then kind of from that I end up going do I want to go back into physio because that's obviously the qualification I had and as much as I enjoyed it when I was studying physio and working as a physiotherapist I felt that as I there was always like oh this is a really interesting case this patient has got xyz and what's going to happen next and always the next bit was nothing to do with the physio um, that was more towards the medicine towards the doctor side and then I applied on a whim um, to see I was like I wonder if I could I wonder if I could get in and then that sort of did the application process and then got an interview and I said okay well I'll go to the interview and I'll see if that works out and I did the interview and I got accepted and then I went okay I need to think about if I actually want to do this or not and I deferred that for a year because uh, I wasn't sure and then I played football for another year and then at the end of my contract at Reading I went yeah I'm, I'm gonna do it and that's sort of when I started the degree. It's quite the path that you've had <laughs> throughout the whole day but it seems yeah. as you said at the start winding but has probably ended you up in the place you really want to be with everything. You mentioned the footballing side throughout that and I suppose we talk quite a lot about Birmingham week in week out because of the massive Irish contingent a difficult weekend for you guys I would presume um I don't want to rub it in in any sort of way but also it would feel remiss not to ask you about it <laughs> all things considered what's the mood like in the camp at the moment because obviously Leicester you know that was the team that everyone was saying that the wins against those were possibly some of the most important that you could get and now face two losses. Yeah, um, I obviously figured that question might might come up. Um, I think firstly, like you said, the, the Irish contingent we have at the club now is huge. I think that there is maybe seven of us. I'm not quite sure on the number, but yeah, it's it's a really nice group. And actually, I'm, I am really pleased that all of the girls have, have joined us because it means that as Karen was saying, like some players that now are going professional and, and, and taking that step and that's like, uh, that step into the league. And 
you know, they, they've, they've done really, really well. So I think Jamie is one I'd do special mention to. She's actually not just a, a, like hit the ground running, but she's actually doing things in, in different positions as well and developing herself as a player. So I think it's really nice to see the girls like take leaps and bounds forward. And I, I, I'm, I'm glad they're in the league and showcasing their abilities because obviously what they do represents sort of all the players in the country as a nation. And I think they're doing themselves really proud. Um, now to come on to the actual point you asked me about. Uh, yeah, with less, <laughs> with, we, uh, we always with support less. a shout out to players that are doing well in yeah. the league. So. Yeah, yeah, I'm really I, happy I, for I, them. But if you want to send them home to Steve and Peter, that's fine too. You know, I was I when when that all happened and it all came about, I was like, this is great because I love I love watching those players and I love, love watching the clash of the team. So it was really fun to see them all come over and have their mini competitions over here as well. So it's pretty good. Um, but yeah, with the with the Leicester game, it was it was something that we've unfortunately it's it's not gone our way and, and that and that's football sometimes but the earlier on in the season I think we we weren't proud of ourselves in the way that we we played and we were playing we weren't showcasing ourselves in the right way uh the Leicester game the first one I think they on the day did better than we did we had lots and lots of chances didn't uh, capitalize on any of them and they they capitalized on the chance on the day and that's what mattered Yesterday was, uh, I think, tougher to take. We had um, a sending off that was a bit uh, divisive, I think is probably the way I'd say it. Um, Very diplomatic. Hold well on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, but it was a bit divisive. I personally, you know, I, I think it was uh, an incorrect decision, but I'm entitled to my opinion as the referee is entitled to theirs. But even after that, I think, so obviously we went 1-0 down, then conceded. The, the second half was with 10 players actually quite impressive for the girls to to work really really hard get a goal back I mean with 10 players you can that's all you can really ask for um it's frustrating that's the team we we hope to get try and get points off and and instead they've they've taken the points but there are still lots of other games in the season I've seen I've seen players and around you also Bristol last season I know they didn't survive it in the end but they were had a, in a really really bad position come Christmas and actually caught up quite a lot and put a lot of pressure on those above them and that's all we can do. We can just put pressure on the people that are above us, keep on chasing, and, and we'll see how the season turns out, really. Is there any part of you that kind of finds it, it's not, I don't know if exciting is the right word, but is it a different kind of motivation to say when you were doing really well in your first year with Redden? Like is, what does this feel like? What is the difference? Yeah, it is, it is a different motivation. I think like I've yeah played in the WSL for uh, maybe seven, seven, eight years, maybe. I'm not, I'm not quite sure on how long now. And I've definitely done kind of been anywhere and anywhere within the league. I think when we first came in with Reading, that was I was in a relegation battle with Reading against Doncaster. So I've sort of been here before. And in the last few seasons, we've been you know closer towards that relegation battle. But actually, like it's a really exciting place to be. I know I know it doesn't feel like it and it, it's daunting, but this is this is exciting. Top of the table, that's exciting. Bottom of the table, that's exciting. Like that's the sort of football that you want to be in. These are the pressure games that in 15, 20 years' time I will look back on and I will remember these are the important matches for me, not the middle middle table teams. You said there about the like you have quite a lot of experience in the WSL and obviously there's players like Louise Quinn in there as well. What what are the sort of things that players like you were saying to maybe some of the younger because there are quite a few young players on the Birmingham squad and quite a lot of players who are maybe only experiencing the WSL for the first time. What are you saying to those players in this situation? Because maybe you with a little bit of maturity can say that it's exciting and it's fun, but it also might be kind of scary to another player. How do you navigate that as a team? Great question. I think uh, so. First of all, Lou has been a, a mass, absolutely massive addition. I think she, as of yesterday, she is our top goal scorer, um, which is pretty <laughs> impressive. Uh, she, yeah, she's been a massive addition, and and she's a, like a credit to the club, really. Um, there are a few senior players within the the team right now, and I think we're seeing more and more people step up, and even those that aren't necessarily already considered senior experienced players are all stepping up in in their own rights as well but be it like what they say or or how they're performing as I said Jamie being an example of that I think um there are like yesterday some of the talk was you know long season ahead lots and lots of games I mean a few games ago nobody expected us to get any points of Arsenal and, and that happened so I think football is really unpredictable and all you need is a, is a run of form and it's that sort of motivating I mean you know and we're not kind of filling people's heads with something that that isn't true because it, it can happen and we've all seen it in football we've all seen last last weekend saves last weekend 
purpose of the season and, and think it's kind of driving that motivation and just saying if we keep on working hard and, and doing the right things week in week out we can only be proud of ourselves at the end of the day and I think that's what we're all trying to do. We've seen some last weekend implosions in the Women's National League in Ireland as well so yeah they're good fun. <laughs> Um, Poor Karen, yeah. we won't make you relive it any more than you already yeah. have. <laughs> the new season will come around and hopefully you'll be able to. <laughs> Move on. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, well, Harriet, thank you so much for joining us and best of luck both with the rest of the season and with your studies. And um, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. That's it for Hi, this. Thanks for having me. Yeah. <laughs> that's it for this week's Koi Gig Pod on OTB Sports in association with Cabri FC official snack partner to the Republic of Ireland Women's National Thing Team thank you for listening and we'll see you again next Tuesday the Koi Gig Pod on OTB Sports in association with Cadbury. a player and a half deserves a glass and a half of support